I asked his former hedge fund manager to share the secrets of the stock market with us because I sure don't know what the hell I'm doing. He's a finance professor. He's got multiple books on the subject and he's a YouTuber. Welcome, Patrick Boyle. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Now, listen, it's obvious these are dark times. Inflation is reaching all time highs. A new variant is here. Global supply issues are here. So I want you to shoot straight with me. Does anybody know what's going on? It's a it's a tough environment. But, you know, the truth in markets is that it's always tough. Like there's there's this idea that there's certain times when everyone knew exactly what was coming. But of course, when you think that something else surprises you. OK, OK, listen here. I'm against everyone knows I'm against giving financial advice to my viewers. So we're just going to turn off the cameras for a second. And uh, I'm just going to ask you, yes or no, should I buy GameStop? Because I'm, I'm, all the kids are into it. Honestly, the $10 million studio, it's rough on the bank account. You know, rent's very high. I need a little windfall. Okay, as you know, I'm doing this giveaway. I, I, I need the cash flow. Is GameStop a good buy right now? I don't like to use the term to the moon that often. But, <laughs> you know, all, all jokes aside, I, I wouldn't touch it. Like, I, I just think that there's, it's it's all risk and rather questionable return to me. <sighs> Damn it. Okay, let's hit the hard questions here, uh, Patrick. <laughs> Patrick. Uh, Omicron, it's here. The, the the Avengers, the Transformers in game is here. Now, do you mean Omicron, the, uh, the virus or the yes, cryptocurrency? Yes, the virus. Oh, yes. sorry. Oh, yeah, 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 I know. We're going to get to the crypto, don't worry. Listen, we don't know how bad it is, but should we be, should I take my money out of the market? What should I do here? You know, I don't think so, because in, in truth, we're, we're sort of prepared for viruses or the idea is there. And actually, the world knows how to deal with it much better than they did a year and a half ago when the first version of COVID came. And in truth, I, I don't think it's, it's worth panicking in terms of investing, because what I've seen in the past with investors is often they'll panic when, uh, you know, a bad piece of news comes out and they'll pull all of their money out of the market. And we'll say even if they're right and the market falls, they never buy on the low. They always think it's going lower. And so then it's kind of five years later and they buy at a new high, you know. So unless you really have a plan for how you're going to get back in, I think if you're invested and if you're investing for the long term, just stick with your plan. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, if, if you look at my portfolio, I think the honest truth is I've been probably buying high and uh selling low. <laughs> it's actually the biggest problem for investors. There's a really interesting guy, Jack Schwager. I actually I interviewed him on my channel about a year ago, and he's studied kind of how investors behave. And one of the really interesting things he found was that even with some of the best performing funds, like the highest return, lowest risk funds, he's found that people invest in them always after they've done well and then on any little sell-off they take their money out so the average investor in the fund doesn't actually get the return off the fund and so in a fund, once you're aware that people do that you you can possibly see some of that in yourself and you just have to adjust your behavior to sort of not make the the mistakes that we're almost programmed to make in markets yeah guys look, look it's easy just just Buy low, sell high. It's just that <laughs> it's that simple. Uh, no, that is that is very interesting. Now, I do want to ask because as much as kind of we kid, it, it does seem like we are in an interesting time, especially with how the Fed has been acting and where the stock market is. And I want to ask you about inflation. OK, so everyone heard the headlines. We had like 6% inflation in October or an annualized inflation. And I get the basics. Like you print more money, more money's in the big pool. Your money's worth less. That's not exactly how it works, I, I think. Can you explain for someone like me, just a, a sort of a novice with this stuff, how inflation works? Well, the truth is inflation just is complicated. Like if you're confused by it, it means that you're, you're thinking about it, you know? And so... There, there are many things that are coming together to cause inflation, you know. So we have the simple idea of sort of extra money being printed. That makes very logical sense that sort of the more you print, the less it's worth. But interestingly enough, there's some sort of complicated things relating to the supply of money where often that money is getting printed and essentially it just sits in bank vaults. It doesn't actually go out 
to people. And so actually the supply of money in the market hasn't really grown as much as the supply of printed money, which is kind of interesting. But what, what we are seeing at the moment, there's a few things. There appear to be big energy problems in the world that relate to basically all of the oil wells and whatever being shut off uh, a year and a half ago. And then essentially they haven't turned them back on because th there's two reasons. One is just that, that it's difficult to sort of turn an oil well back on if you're not sure that the oil price will remain steadily high. And the second thing is there's just been quite a strong uh, green push over the last 12 months where a lot of governments are essentially saying that they don't want the oil to come out of the ground, which then makes the oil companies choose to leave it in the ground. Th then we also have the supply chain disruptions and they are, you know, hopefully a lot of people understand them, but it's even that what happened, what we're seeing in inflation is actually inflation in goods much more than inflation in services. Because when people got locked down, they had money coming in and they spent it on stuff rather than on eating at restaurants or going out on experiences. And so you end up with a huge amount of, we'll say just everyone bought extra, extra computer equipment for home, uh, cameras, all sorts of things, uh, which drove up the price of those. Uh, there was the the computer chip shortages. There's even just the shipping problems in moving stuff from, you know, a lot of this stuff is made in China and shipped over here. And all of those ports are having problems. There's all these backlogs. And so a lot of the inflation we're seeing is really just money chasing goods that aren't being made. Like it's, you know, if you look at the price of used cars right now, they've rocketed, but equally they, they were impossible to, to sell, uh, you know, a year ago in the depths of the lockdown. So it's, it's really the the effect of sort of shutting down and reopening an economy has caused these problems. And then when we look at a, a new variant that could possibly make do this it all over worse, again, it's it's really uh, interesting to see what would happen. But inflation is kind of coming at us from multiple directions. Uh, it's it, it's a, a great oversimplification to just say it's printing money that's caused it. Well, yeah, and yeah, exactly, and that's what I try to avoid is these oversimplifications. But I'm just sort of not smart enough, <laughs> smart enough to really get my hands around it. I just put my, put all my trust in Jay Powell, basically, um, which I'm not sure is the best idea. <laughs> but, <laughs> but am I cynical for thinking, and just in general, that we are overdue for some sort of correction? Because let me explain my thinking on this. Like, it seems like. Okay, if you go into a doctor's office and you you somebody slammed uh, a hammer on your hand and your hand's all mangled and the person is not reacting, the hand is not hurt yet, there's something wrong with the situation, okay? It, you're going to go, oh, you'll feel that tomorrow, whatever. In the same way, I feel like the stock market or the economy got like hammered by the, by the virus. And then the, the stock market did not reflect what had happened to the economy. And it's sort of, it, I feel like it hasn't reflected that. Maybe you can explain differently, but am I cynical for just like waiting for us to feel the pain? It's a funny thing, because if we look back a year, the, the market actually reacted very rationally because, you know, if you remember January through March of 2020, the, the market sold off horrifically, like it was just right. down, down, down. And then essentially like the, the global governments just came out and said, it doesn't make sense for all of these, we'll say, good, well-run businesses to just be shut down because of a random event that happened. And so they intervened in the markets, essentially saying that if you're running a business, like if you owned a restaurant, they say to you, we're not going to have your restaurant go bust, but equally you can't open the restaurant. And so, and all businesses got that, you know, PPP and other type, uh, it, it was a global thing. But what it meant was that that you could invest in stocks and in companies with the idea that they won't, at least in the short term, shut down because of COVID. So then it became that you just looked at the long term earnings. You essentially looked through the whole COVID event towards the, the bounce back, you know, and now I guess we're we're in the bounce back. And the question is, have things gotten too frothy? Like do th there's always this problem in markets where if if investors don't ever sort of get punished for bad behavior for sort of taking inappropriate <laughs> risk, just, they do less, more bad behavior, take more risk. Right. right. 
And so that's kind of what, what we're possibly seeing is that not only have investors kind of decided that, that there's no way they can lose money, but they've also decided that the craziest bets are the best bets, you know, because if risk doesn't exist, well, then you just shoot for return while normally you're trying to balance risk and return. So, okay, let me ask you this. It seems like every 18 year old with a hundred bucks from their mom can invest easier than ever. Um, but my question is, do you think we're actually doing a good job of training these new investors to like think? Uh, like we're giving retail investors sometimes like the power of what you might used to give to like an institution. But are we training them to actually wield that? Like, like as someone who's taught students, what do you think? Is it like, feels like we're giving everyone like F1 cars, like, you know, 100x leverage, you know, these things that can like completely wreck you uh and then just telling them oh yeah, yeah go ahead like there, there is that thing in in that you know especially new investors they they sort of like i you know i started out investing in the dot-com bubble in the late 90s and it was a very similar thing back then where it was almost like the crazier the company and the wilder the claims the more it went up you know so a lot of people my age kind of piled into all these crazy stocks and everyone said this is madness but you know these guys were making a hundred percent return in a week you know and it, it looked great for a while and then the problem is that you know reality uh reappeared and you know that that kind of has to happen with everything you know like the it, the, and a lot of people, they all think they'll know when to get out. And the problem is that that you don't really. In fact, I have a finance professor friend who I was talking to a while ago, and he kind of loves the idea of investing in Tesla, but it always looks too expensive to him because he kind of, uh, you know, analyzes it. <laughs> and he, he managed to buy Tesla a few years ago, you know, and it instantly it kind of doubled. And, he, and it, once again, it was too expensive. So he sold it. And of course, it went up 10 times since then. And the problem is, you know, like when you get in and out of these things like uh you know how, how do you get back in again you know and and he actually i i like his point of view he says he doesn't feel bad about it at all because he has a system and he follows the system and yes if he broke the system on tesla he'd have way more money but if he broke it on everything else he would have lost all of his money so yeah do you so in that way do you think it's much more uh you'll be much more successful if you just have a system and you stick with your system and don't like basically take short-term lessons from things like tesla which seem like they're very hard to predict well that that's kind of my belief is that it, well it's just because my approach to investing is essentially like a a back testing approach where i just download a load of data and work out how prices have moved in the past and try and try and invest based upon that and so you know, I'm of course going to tell you that, that, that that's the best way of doing things because that's how I do things. But it, it seems to me that if you if you can come up with a good system with like good reasons, I even say to a lot of people, even if you're not kind of a quant investor, I, I feel that if you buy something, write down, like just to get a notepad, write down why you bought it and when you'll sell it, like what, how much it will have to fall for you to sell it or admit you were wrong. And if it goes up, at what point is it reasonable? to sell or do you hold it forever you know but but to come up with a plan in advance because if you don't have a plan you know one of my favorite quotes is a mike tyson quote i don't know if i told you this one already um where yeah, where he sense. says uh you know everyone has a plan in boxing till they get a punch in the face you know and it's the <laughs> same thing in investing right where people you know, they, they think they'll get into the stock market and they'll be really rational and, and they have great ideas. And then, you know, the minute it either falls too much or rises too much, their emotions take control of them and it's gone, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. <laughs> Spe speaking of emotions getting the best of us, um, meme coins. I've just been dying inside watching that all, uh, that that whole facade go up. Listen, like Shiba coin, all the Floki. Listen, I think personally, it's ridiculous speculation bubble. I've been very clear about that. I think it's basically a Ponzi scheme. But I heard a large YouTuber the other day, it's finance YouTuber, telling me over the phone, like not for an audience, he just goes, look, I legit think meme coins have inherent value. I think the fact they draw attention gets them money, that money will then turn into utility somewhere down the road. Sort of argument. Like, <laughs> we'll just, 
We'll sell you a plane and then we'll get a lot of money and then we'll build the plane with the money we raise, basically. Uh, what do you think about that? The problem is you could make that argument about anything, you know, like to say that there's inherent value to something that's firstly, like it's very difficult to say anything that doesn't have cash flows has inherent value, right? Like it's just it's just a thing, you know, it's kind of the same argument can be made about any sort of collectible like art, like, uh, you know, you name it, old stamps, things like that. And so, yes, there there possibly is something to the idea that if something sort of have has had value for a long time and there's a big community that believes in it, that, that it could possibly hold on. But I'm not sure that that relates to like, you know, the, the, uh, the, the funny one over the weekend was the Omicra uh, cryptocurrency. You know, I guess there was one name that anyhow, because it's a Greek letter. And uh, as soon as it was announced that there was a new variant of the virus, people went out and bought the cryptocurrency that has That's the same name as the virus. And unbelievable. How much did it go up? I, I believe 900% with the, <laughs> uh, the thing I saw, you know. But but it, the funny thing is there's actually kind of a long history of this wow. in markets. Um, a guy I used to work with had done all sorts of studies on this. And, you know, whenever there was like good news in, we'll say, the tech sector, every stock with sort of micro or something like that in its name would mm -hmm. go up. And there's even things where stocks that have ticker symbols that sound like um, the ticker symbol of the company that has good news will go up, you know, and in truth, you could build a system to invest based, but, you know, to make money to trade based upon that. But it's not, uh, you know, if it works, it works. And I feel, you know, you can do what you think works. But in terms of like for someone to put their money in something as a long term store of value, I really don't think that like, uh, you know, sort of a, a coin that's tied to an internet joke has any long-term, uh, you know, investment potential. Wow. The memers are going to be very upset with you about that. The, the, the Reddit memers, not happy. Uh, okay. Speaking of Reddit, let's talk about Bitcoin. Okay. Uh, Michael Saylor is a famous CEO. I, I don't know if you know who that is. He's gone 100% basically 100% into Bitcoin. With well, he was a big guy in the dot-com bubble as well. Yes. And now he's back with, with the crypto. Uh, well, we'll get explode. to that. Yeah, he's he's famous now for claiming that Bitcoin will basically do anything for you. It'll make you immortal. It'll save the world. And also, by the way, make everyone rich uh, and incidentally make him rich too, which is a nice side effect. Uh, what do you think? What do you think of that strategy of all in? It's you know we always hear diversify, diversify, diversify. Here's a guy, he's putting his entire reputation on one coin. You know, it, it slightly depends on what you want to do. Like if you have nothing and you walk into a casino, you should probably take the riskiest, highest return bet. And odds are you'll 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 probably walk out with nothing, but there's a small chance that you'll walk away with a fortune, right? And that's what that type of bet is. So if you've got like a hundred bucks and, and uh, you're retiring in three years time, you know, you've no savings, you might need to just roll the dice, like as, <laughs> as inappropriate as that is as investment advice. But for most people, like the way people really grow their wealth, and I've seen this with, uh, you know, hundreds of people, like it's, most people I see who really grow their wealth and who sort of reach a retirement age with, with uh, you know, a large excess of wealth tend to do it slow and steady, like with just sensible investments that work, like, they, you know, investing in, in good businesses, good ideas, you know, like, yes, you can, you can go crazy. The question is even if you do make a fortune on a crazy bet. Do you have the good sense then to realize that you just got lucky and now do sensible things afterwards? And the problem is not a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I want to talk about financial advice YouTubers, I'll say slash influencers. There's been a lot of talk about the hashtag not financial advice movement. You know, people will give you financial advice, but then in a weird get out of jail free card, they will just say not financial advice and it absolves them of all responsibility. What do you think about that? People giving out stock picks sort of more blatantly or I don't know, cavalierly than ever. It's funny to me. It's just it's not something I would do. And it's not something that really anyone I know as a professional would do simply because different people have different risk appetites and so on, you know, and so 
if if someone it, it's kind of like being a doctor and going on YouTube and saying like this medicine will fix everything that's wrong with you it's <laughs> like well you know normally before writing a prescription you ask a patient the uh you know to describe their symptoms you know while the problem with a YouTuber telling you what you should buy is that is that they don't know your financial situation, your goals, anything. And also, it's rather questionable to me, like a lot of the financial YouTubers I've seen are sort of real estate agents who've worked out that you can give financial advice on the Internet. And it's not obvious to me that they're very knowledgeable. But I, I just I wouldn't want to take responsibility for someone's losses. Like if I uh, announced on my channel that there's this stock that you should definitely buy. The the problem with that is like if if it goes horribly wrong, that person can't come to me and say, Patrick, you 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 put me in this thing. I, I'd say, oh, I didn't, you know. And and equally, if it goes really well, will will they stick to my channel for me to announce that it's now time to get out of it? You know, it, it doesn't. To me, that's not how financial advice works. And I'd rather see people learn so that they can give themselves financial advice. Like if you educate mm. yourself, if you read good books on the topic and if you study up on it and learn how professionals look at the market, you can then do your own analysis. And then, of course, you're relying on yourself. You know, you 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 know why you made the investment. And so you equally know when it might be time to sell for a variety of reasons. And to me, that's much more value added than, you know, there's a lot of YouTubers and they're like, here's my portfolio. This is what I bought. This is how much I made it, it to me. Like, I, you know, I, they, they can do what they want, but it's just not obvious to me that that's value added for, for a, a viewer. Now, pivoting a bit from that, and this is sort of one of the final questions I want to ask you. It does feel, it does appear to me that the game is rigged, okay? And so my question is sort of, so now what? So something I find in crypto a lot is that the influencers and the developers are often in on it. They sort of collude yeah. marketing deals. They have private sales that exclude the average investor. They always just sort of know things that the average investor does not. And sometimes they collude to scam, obviously, but I, most of the time they just have more information. So the game is, the game is tilted. And this isn't new, though. This has sort of always been the case in traditional markets as well of asymmetric knowledge. What would you tell investors who are looking at the market? They see that. But the answer doesn't seem to me to be to just throw up your hands and go, well, I guess I'll never invest in anything because, I, I, you know, the game is rigged. I don't think that's a good answer. What would you tell to people who sort of realize that? You know, the the game isn't as rigged as people think. The problem when you look at things like crypto, it's like looking at, you know, I, I think uh, the head of the SEC is described as the Wild West. And in many ways, it's kind of like the most extreme emerging market that there is, you know. Um, a good example, actually, in the United States in the, in the 1920s, pre the 1929 crash, there was a huge, uh, you know, eruption of uh, interest in the stock market and stock values went up. And it was, uh, you know, in many ways, a, a golden age for investors, but equally a golden age for fraudsters. We have people like Charles Ponzi and so on appeared around that time. With this, uh, with that growth, it, it was during a time in which uh, big companies didn't give you any accounts, right? Like, so they'd, they'd issue stock in the company, partial ownership in the company. They wouldn't tell you any accounting, any earnings, any detail. And so people really just invested based on kind of gut feeling and rumors they heard. And of course, the rumors were all spread by, uh, you know, people, people trying, to, yeah. trying to pump the stock. And so it all ended horribly in 1929. And that's when a lot of securities regulation came in. You know, all of the the regulation, that the meaningful regulation came in in the early 1930s that basically said that companies can't lie about stuff and they have to issue us a certain amount of detailed information that might need to be audited and so on. Interestingly, you look around the world and in many emerging markets, you'll find similar situations to the United States in the, in, in the 1920s. And so you look in those countries and you speak to people like, you know, I, I've made a series of videos on Evergrande, the Chinese company, and all Chinese people just invest in real estate, okay? It's the only thing they invest in. And the reason is because they don't trust any of the other stuff. And it's because of this sort of questionable accounting and so on. Now, the great thing about the United States is actually it's one of the better regulated markets in the world. And so actually you do 
get a pretty fair shake when you invest in American, uh, you know, kind of blue chip stocks in the United States. So not penny stocks, but like kind of any respectable big, you know, exchange traded stock you can invest in is, you know, they are forced by law to, to release honest information on a quarterly basis and so on. And this is a good thing. And so the problem now is that I think a lot of people look at things like they look at the world of cryptocurrencies and they think that they get the same protections that they get in, in the US stock market. And it's like, look, you don't get those same protections in a foreign stock market, not to mind in cryptocurrencies. You know, Logan Paul doesn't care about you and your savings, you know? No, and don't tell me that. <laughs> I thought Logan cared. What? <laughs> I know yeah. it, it's it's amazing that a, a YouTube prankster isn't uh, isn't providing the the best financial advice it's available. It's crazy. It's crazy. Listen, I, I do have to actually ask. Like, okay, that that is a fair point, and I'm I'm glad you balanced that uh, that idea out. However, we do see, <laughs> and I got to bring it up. Look, we've seen a lot of uh, these stock these uh these Nancy Pelosi types these uh the. I think Tom Cotton, Cotton might be another one. There are just a There's bunch a list, of yeah. senators who I think it was like over 50 who just this year allegedly have broken the Stock Act, okay, which is the insider trading law. And it doesn't appear that any of them are going to face any kind of problems. And they all seem to be amazing investors right out of the gate, having never been, really been into finance before. And it just seems this amazing thing. What do you think about that? Like, should I just copy? I'm, I'm just starting to think I should copy. Uh, I think it's Pelosi's husband who trades. It's not actually her. It's it's her husband is just this amazing, <laughs> amazing market. I don't know what you'd call it. Timer uh, profit. So, yeah. What do you think about that? You know, that is a problem, but it, it's something that's kind of it has been dealt with and they're passing new regulation about that. So. It, it was actually up until it, only very recently, I forget what year, it actually was not against the law for them to trade on the information they had that related to them passing laws, because insider information meant information from inside a company. Rather, this was sort of outside information that they, they gathered within their their careers. So, of course, there have been laws and there are more laws coming to, to reduce that. But... It, um, you know, obviously the, the thing I don't like about that is it causes people to lose faith in investing. And I, I really do think, you know, if you look at the long term returns of the stock market, it really is the, the best thing to do with your savings. Like it outperforms real estate, it outperforms bonds. There's, you know, it's a really good place for people to put their long term savings for retirement. And of course, then when you see these scandals, the problem is that people do lose faith and they, they decide to make maybe suboptimal decisions because they, they don't want to be scammed. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Yeah. No, I'm chomping at the bit here because you just you just offended a lot of TikTokers. OK, they're upset at you because actually a lot of people say, look, the stock market, that's for that's for boomers who don't understand the power of flipping houses or, uh, you know, all these real estate schemes. I think real estate's fine. I mean, it, real estate, you can make money with real estate, but I didn't, I don't have good data on, you know, real estate versus stock investing. Do you, do you have something to tell us there? I didn't know. Well, that. I mean, there, there's lots, you, you know, you could even just Google this and you'll find it like this. I, I studied with a guy called Elroy Dimson in London who uh, created a time series of sort of almost every asset in the world, like collectibles, um, real estate, bonds, stocks, uh, every country in the world. And you're able to look at the, you know, over 100 years of returns data on that. And you really see that just the reason that a, a, a stock investment should earn more than a real estate investment is just simply that a, a, a stock that you buy, it's actually a business, like you're investing in a business and they're creating goods and services and selling them at a profit. And, and that profit then goes to the owners of the business, which is the shareholders. With real estate, in particular, if it's a home you live in, you're really just getting price appreciation, which is kind of driven by dynamics like increase in population or uh, or really just inflation, you know? And a lot of the return you'll see is, is tied to inflation. And then you've got other things like as interest rates come down, 
home prices tend to go up just because people tend to buy them with borrowed money. And so the lower the interest rates are, the cheaper you can borrow, the more money you can borrow for a given cash flow. So you can spend more on a house. So therefore you see the overall house stock in a country increase in value as rates go down. But of course, we're now possibly at a low of interest rates. And that that's a, a trade that's worked since 19, I think it's like 1982 when interest rates started falling and have continued to fall since. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you kind of need to understand the drivers of the different asset classes in order to, to decide how you might invest based upon like how you view the economy at a given point in time. That's an amazing answer. I. <laughs> I've learned so much here today, Patrick. Thank you so much for giving us the stock market secrets. And especially that last answer uh, was incredibly insightful for understanding why real estate uh, appreciates over time, why stocks appreciate over time. If people want to find you, they can find you at Patrick Boyle, the YouTube channel. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. That's kind of my main uh sort of communication tool to the world. So yeah. Guys, go subscribe to him. He puts out amazing analysis all the time. I love to have him on the channel. Yeah, it, uh, amazing. I'm glad we got the chance to do this. Thank you for having me on. All right. Hope you guys learned something. Be safe out there. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.